with me in the press box in Visakhapatnam is the Guardian's cricket correspondent, Ali Martin. Ali, I like to think of you as the spiritual leader of the press pack. Where do you put yourself? Uh, I, I, I see it very much as a, as a democracy. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I'm, I'm very happy to um, lead where I can, but it's, it's very much a collective effort. Um, Visakhapatnam is a coastal city. It's much different to Hyderabad, where we were last week. It's a smaller place. It's a really important naval port um, in India on on the Bay of Bengal. You've been here before. I haven't, but it does feel like the city sort of fit to burst, both literally in the hotels and sort of with some of the excitement around taxi drivers. We've got pictures of KS Barat, the local boy on the road, real sense of excitement around the place. Absolutely, and yeah, you're right, it makes a big change from the sort of being in the mega city of Hyderabad where England took that 1-0 lead. Uh, and um, yeah, we're, we're by the coast, we've got a nice sea breeze uh, blowing in. And as you say, yeah, I was here back in 2016 for the test match uh, between England and India here. And um, and yeah, memories are kind of flooding back, really. It's a kind of, uh, you know, quite an evocative sort of rickety ground around us, but it's, um, it's pretty cool. I, I hope that the, that the crowds turn up for this one. Um, and going back to that match, yeah, that was, um, yeah, it was an eventful game. It, I think England attempted a blockathon at the end, which didn't quite work for them. Um, my other memories are on day one of a, a dog running onto the outfield and, well, let's just say uh, doing its business and, uh, and the umpires having to call an early tee. And also that I think... I believe I'm right in saying that uh, England lost by 246 runs and Virat Kohli scored 248 in the match, which uh, serves as a reminder of what India are missing in this uh, in this Test series so far. Yeah, I remember watching that game here a few years ago. I just got very excited when the dog came onto the field. Um, so let's hear from the England captain then, Ben Stokes. He spoke to to us earlier on today and he confirmed England's lineup for the second test. Jimmy Anderson comes in for Mike Wood this week. Um, and obviously, we had to make a forced change with Leach's injury last week, so uh, it's great to be able to um, get Shoei Bashir out there and get him his first game for England. What have you seen in the conditions to go with that team? Obviously, you picked three frontline spinners last week. You've done the same again this week. What have you seen it in that surface? Um, well, yesterday's look compared to today's look was just to sort of see what a day had done. Um, it wasn't too noticeable, but if anything, it just looks a little bit drier than what it did yesterday. So, um, yeah, it's about sort of backing your decisions um, with, with what you go for when you pick a team. And, um, yeah, look, we, we just feel, again, the way in which we were able to operate with our, with our spinners um, was a massive boost for us. And, um, yeah, look, obviously we've had an injured spinner from last week, so... Um, the, the thing that made it very easy was just we bring, bring our other spinner in who we've got in the squad. Let's take some of those individuals in order then. You mentioned Jack. How is he um, and how long do you think he might be out for? Uh, I can't say how long he's going to be out for. Um, obviously our medical team are, are looking after Leachy every day, assessing it every day. Uh, one thing he was keen to, to get over is we may have lost a player but we've gained a coach. <laughs> he's very um, he's a very upbeat person. Um, I think he's taking this in his stride considering how frustrating this would be for him uh, with the layoff he had with his back to then come back and, and have an injury like this. But um, yeah, look, he's, he's a very, very popular member of the group. He's very important to us from um, not only on the field, but also off the field. Um, and yeah, he's, he's putting on, well, I don't think he's putting on a brave face. I think he's, he's just happy with, with where he's at, well, as happy as he possibly can be, even though he's injured, if that makes sense. Let's talk about Shoei Bashir. What a week he's had, 10 days he's had. But also, you first saw him bowl on Twitter. What have you seen from him then and up to now in the nets uh, to know that he's going to be ready to go this week? Um, yeah, obviously faced a lot of him out in Abu Dhabi and, and some more this week as well. Um, and yeah, you obviously, you know, when you face someone um, with what you think is potential, um, you know, it makes them even better. Um, I think what... You know the the thing that he possesses is that just natural ability, the delivery he releases the ball from, how much energy he tries to put on the ball, and you know someone bowling from that height and putting that much on the ball is always going to get you know sort of natural variation, which is obviously something that's very hard to um, to play against out here. Some balls can some balls can spin, some balls will skid on. Um, so yeah, look, um, you know I'm fully backing him, um, the skill set that he's got, and looking forward to him going out on the field and uh, hopefully putting on the show. What about the decision to go with Jimmy over Mark Wood? Um, firstly, is Woody OK? And secondly, I think you've got a nice little milestone for Jimmy that you're enjoying. <laughs> yeah, uh, look, I thought Woody's efforts last week were fantastic, um, given sort of the, the placid nature of the wicket. 
Um, what Woody does every time he steps in the field for England is give his absolute all, regardless of of sort of what he's got presented in front of him. Um, he's always saying he'll run in all day for me, run in all day for the team, and that's certainly what he did last week. Um, and obviously, it's great to to bring someone like Jimmy in who's got a, an unbelievable amount of experience, but um, I think what maybe goes under the radar a bit is actually his record out in India, um, considering what he's known for. So, yeah, having that experience and, and bringing Jimmy in um, has got nothing to do with the fact that he'll also be playing a game with someone who's now the 100th person since he made his debut. <laughs> and how are you? You're going to have a little trundle in training today. Now, I know we shouldn't get carried away because it's all about a, a process to get you bowling back in the summer, but that knee's obviously coming along OK. Yeah, it's gone on well. Um, got through last week unscathed. Um, took a lot of confidence out of, of everything last week, and um, yeah, just been building up to this point um, to, to sort of start getting back into the back to bowling program, um, which has you know been on the um, sort of been a talking point for a while now. Is when's the right time to do it? And I think now everything's feeling really good, and I'm feeling you know confident and excited to get back into that kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, you're right. Shouldn't get carried away with it. You've been in this position before as a team, Ben, in India, one up after one played, what did you learn from the, the last tour to take into this one? Um, you're never in front until you win and you're never behind until you lose. That's, you can never never take what's sort of happening in the here and now as, as anything, you know. I think it's, even through victory, I think you can take a, a massive amount of learning from that is that um, if we ever find ourselves in position, not just in India, but anywhere in the world, that when we are in front, you know, we need to make sure that we're still on top of it and we're not just expecting things to happen because it's amazing how quickly a game can turn around. Just finally, you'll know that outside the camp, what you did last week has raised lots and lots of expectations. You guys always talk about being present, staying where your feet are, not getting too attached to the outcome. But in reality, how difficult is that to do? How, e- how hard is it to keep everyone focused on the process? Yeah, well, that's the thing. Through success comes expectation. Um, and we've had huge success without any expectation. Um, and I think the, that quote I've used quite a few times about sticking to the process without being emotionally attached to the outcome is, is absolutely perfect for, for, what, um, for what this team needs. Um, we just focus on this week. We'll then move our focus on to the next week and just keep going on and on, on, and, on and on from there. Um, and, yeah, look, it's great. Having success obviously brings expectation from people outside of, of our little little group, um, but we we know what works well and we know what we when we focus on things that that gets the best out of our ability. Cheers, Ben. Good luck. Thank you. That was Ben Stokes speaking to me earlier. Ali, let's start with Shoaib Bashir making his debut after only six first-class games. I mean, that's not even the most remarkable thing after you think the last ten days that he's had with all these visa problems, having to go back to the UK. And Ben Stokes has revealed to us that he first saw him bowl on Twitter. That's right, yeah. It was um, it was last summer. He was, uh, I don't know, doom-scrolling through Twitter or what they now call X uh, and spotted this young lad bowling to Sir Alistair Cook, uh, Somerset against Essex. And he saw something he liked. He saw, uh, you know, he's obviously he's six foot four, so it comes from quite a high release point, uh, which England seems to have, you know, they come into this tour, that's what they, they really wanted to, to bring to this tour this time around. Um, he liked what he saw, and if you're getting a, a player as with the calibre of Alistair Cook, particularly against spin in that kind of bother, then you've probably got something about you. Nevertheless, it is an incredible fast tracking to go from there, bounce into the Lions camp in the UAE that was uh, in November, uh, and I think they took seven spinners on that on that trip. So there was a there was a lot of competition there, but um, here he is now, uh, having gone back home to sort the visa problem out get back out on that final day in Hyderabad where he arrived at 8 o'clock in the morning went straight to the ground, watched his new teammates uh, put, put themselves 1-0 up and now here he is with Jack Leach's injury, his Somerset teammate opening up a spot. Yeah, Somerset are becoming a bit of a, a production line for spinners for England, we know the pitches that they've been playing on at Taunton in the past couple of years there was Don Bess Leach who's injured, he's got the knee injury which means he can't play in this second test, now is showing Bashir He's only played six first-class matches. He's only got ten wickets. We think of it as a bit of a, a left-field selection, but England have had another left-field selection on this tour in Tom Hartley, and they've done it through... What, what Stoke says, I've played cricket in India a lot. I think I know what sort of bowlers are going to be successful. They were haunted, weren't they, by what Aksar Patel did to, to them three years ago, and they've been thinking for a long time about tall spinners with a high release point who put a lot of action on the ball and that is the sort of bowler that Shoaib Bashir is. He certainly is. I, I enjoyed watching him bowl in the nets yesterday to uh, 
uh, to the England captain and uh, I think Stokes said that it would have been a very good catch at first slip but he did find the edge of his bat, uh, got him a few times in the Abu Dhabi pre-series camp as well um, and I really enjoyed it. I mean, it, and the other thing is if you, if you are a young spinner who's in the nets against England, um, they really go for you because of the way they attack the ball. So I don't know, it's a bit like, uh, what do they say? If you, can, if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a dodgeball. Well, if you can uh, survive a net session against the Baz ballers, then um, you know, you can, you, you're doing pretty well. Never been a better time either for a spinner to make their England test debut. Hartley last week, Rayan Ahmed and Will Jacks in Pakistan last winter, all three of them took five wicket hauls. Andy Zaltzman has been on to us. He said the previous 10 spinners to make debuts for England, so all the way back from Simon Kerrigan to Matt Parkinson, who did half a game in the, the first test match of the stokes McCullum era. You remember he was a concussion substitute. So those 10 spinners took a combined 18 for 1,135 on debut with an average of 63. Since Will Jacks was asked to play in that first test match in Pakistan, Jacks Rayan Ahmed and Tom Hartley are a combined 22 for 529 at an average of 24. Of all Stokes's um, talents as a captain, Ali, and there are many, looking after inexperienced spinners seems to be a real super strength. It, it really does, and, and you could only you have to go back not very far just to that first evening in Hyderabad where Tom Hartley saw his first ball in test cricket uh, fly out the ground for six um, and he was leaking runs but Stokes pushed him through and um, uh, you know and obviously the results as we saw at the end of the game were, were there to see uh, I saw a very slightly pointed tweet from Gavin Hamilton admittedly a sort of uh, you know former England all round a bit of seam up that he played that just that one test uh, but I saw him say you know that is how you handle a debutant and um, uh, even when we were talking to Ben Stokes last night about the prospects of giving Bashir his first cap. He said, you only make your test debut once and I want to make it as fun and as special as I can for those players. Um, and, I mean, that, as you say, going back to Will Jacks, Ray and Ahmed, <laughs> we talk about Ray and Ahmed. I mean, he's he's younger than Shoah Bashir and yet here he is um, about to play his third test match uh, and he knows he has the full backing of his captain and a captain who doesn't care about leaking runs. It's all about the wickets for Ben Stokes. I mean, the daft thing about Ray and Armin is that his two caps are going to be the most experienced out of England's three frontline spinners uh, here in Vizag. The thing about Bashir as well, obviously, the, the 10 days that he's had, so putting aside the fact that he is a 20-year-old spinner with six first-class matches and about to play his first um, game for England... There was all that stuff that was going on last week. Um, you know, he had to go back to the UK to get his visa. And then the really lovely thing that we've been told is about how when Bashir first came to the ground in Hyderabad last Sunday, what turned out to be the fourth day, he got a massive ovation from the team. They were really pleased to see him. And Ben Stokes, because I think Bashir had only arrived in India on the Sunday morning, I think Stokes said that Bashir got off the plane at 8.30, went straight to the hotel, had a shower, then went to the ground... And he was saying to Bashir, no, you don't have to be here. You don't have to be here to watch this. Go and rest up. And Bashir was, no, no, no. I want to see this. And, and what an amazing experience. What a first taste of Test cricket that must have been. Absolutely. And I think that goes for any player that's walking into this dressing room right now. They are living their best life in this England team at present under Stokes. Um, and it's also fascinating chatting to Stokes generally about the overall philosophy. This, this idea that results don't matter, which... You know, when, as you mentioned earlier, the, the hotels are fit to burst here with touring parties. There's a lot of people spending a lot of money to come out and see England. And so squaring the notion of results not mattering to people who have, you know, putting their life savings into coming out to follow them is not always easy to square. Nevertheless, there is method in it. You know, it, as Stokes said, a test match, it's not a start and an end. It is a, it is a four, five day journey to get to that result. And if you're too tunnel visioned about the result, you won't produce your best cricket. Um, England very much play in the moment these days and that was kind of evidenced by that 190 run turnaround in the first test and I don't think the six first class matches the ten wickets or the visa issue is even the most remarkable thing about this Bashir story it was what Stokes revealed to us last night and that his first awareness of him as a bowler was seeing a video on Twitter of Bashir's county championship debut bowling to Sir Alistair Cook sees this clip sends it into his little WhatsApp group that he's got with Rob Key and Brendan McCollum and a few months later he's here making his test debut. Yeah, it's, it's an extremely modern call-up. Um, I, I thought Brendan McCollum, oh, he didn't speak to us, he was speaking to uh, radio back home in New Zealand but he mentioned about Nathan Lyon and I thought it was actually a very good point to make that 
Nathan Lyon made his first class debut. Uh, sorry, made his test debut after about four first class matches, and we're looking at you know the guy that's now gone past 500 test wickets. So if you see them early, then um, what, you know there's no reason not to thrust them in. Albeit you do have to handle with care because you don't want these guys to to, to take a backward step on the big stage because um, you're hoping that they'll flourish and, and go on for a while. So it was Alistair Cook batting when Ben Stokes first became aware of Shoaib Bashir with that clip on Twitter or X or whatever the kids want to call it these days. It's your choice, Elon. Um, and Alistair Cook's obviously a friend of the show. So we asked Alistair Cook exactly what he made of Shoaib Bashir on his first class debut. Well, I think he's got the a main actually spins the ball very hard, um, which I think uh, as Swanee was a big advocate of to start off, it's only early in your career you you can spin spin the ball, the the control and the um, discipline and learning how to you can teach all that. But actually, the ability to to spin the ball as well. And you know, he's tall, he's tall, so he's um he's got some very natural attributes which will help. Um, I, what I was impressed when when I faced him was he didn't bowl that many bad balls. He had control. Um, he liked the contest. Um, so uh, it'd be interesting to see how we go. There's some very good reports from training camps in, in UAU and some. If you've gone, uh, gone. I think some videos of him bowling some absolute cracking balls. So, you know, it's a big ask in any 18 year old to to come in um, uh, and play. But no, he's certainly one which, you know, you trust Ben and Brendan's judgment. Actually, you know, they've got a lot of decisions right with picking players. And if they didn't think he was ready for it. They would, they wouldn't be selecting him. So they must be thinking with the balance of side they can go with that they can cover him and hide him enough when they needed to. But when they want to throw in the ball, that they're confident he he will be good enough to play. You mentioned his height. Why is height so important in India? Well, I, I, I certainly think over the last couple of years that the success of Axar Patel in terms of the height that he bowls, he can just fire it in at the pitch, you know, I, I, and that gives, um, I suppose, for them like more control. I mean, if you're getting that extra bounce, spins like bounce, and if you've got that that natural height, the bounce should be a should be a, a natural attribute you have that having to work on it. So I, I think that that's probably you know one of the reasons. That was Sir Alistair Cook talking to Daniel Norcross. Ali, so there's been one in ch- one enforced change for England. That's Shoei Bashir coming in for the injured uh, Jack Leach. The other one is James Anderson in for Mark Wood. So once again, England going with three front line spinners just the one seamer were we expecting that Wood would get a rest after playing in Hyderabad last week? Yeah I mean I think the point's been made since the selection was announced that obviously Wood only did only bowl those 25 overs um, he was slightly neutered by conditions I felt I think he he felt he paled in comparison to Jesper Bumrah I think that's pretty harsh on himself it's very typical of Mark Wood to be that harsh on himself but um, when you're comparing yourself with someone that has the range of skills of Jesper Bumrah um, but Mohamed Siraj for example in that first test was also a bit of a passenger it, um, yeah, they've obviously had a look at the pitch out there um, and uh, they probably read pitches better than I do. I read them a bit like I read the Russian alphabet, to be honest. But um, uh, g- going from the, the test match we saw here last year, it started off well and um, and then went south pretty quickly. Well, they, they had a long look at it this morning or this afternoon when they rocked up to train England. So first it was Stokes and McCullum who were looking at the pitch. They stared at it for ages, walked away, had a little chat... Then they called Ollie Pope, the vice captain, out of the, the dressing room. By this point, some journalists, not mentioning any names, had got a little bit too close to the pitch, so the groundsman had covered it up because he didn't want us to see what was going on. But then Stokes walked over to it again and said, get those covers off, I want I want to look at it again. So then there was a chat between Stokes, Pope and McCullum, and we were actually pretty surprised when Stokes was able to name the team, but England are decisive, aren't they? They are decisive. They they do like to go early. Quite often in, at home, it's two days early just to give all the members of the squad um, full clarity on where they stand, so they can tailor their final bits of preparation towards going into the test match. Um, and yeah, Jimmy Anderson, you know, I guess a 41-year-old solitary seamer is is on one level quite a big ask. Um, but obviously, we we know that Jimmy Anderson is, is remains a prime athlete. It's extraordinary, really. I mean, this is his. This 2024 will be his 22nd successive year as a Test cricketer, uh, and and you know, and obviously we've made the uh, people are going to be making the point between now and the, that first ball that 
Uh, he made his test debut, what, 144 days before Shoah Bashir was even born. So um, it's, it's quite the swing. What are they? Well, they're the average, uh, average 30 years old between them. Maybe we should put it that way. It, it's a lopsided attack, isn't it, when you think you've got three spinners with three caps between them. Jimmy Anderson, I think this is going to be his 184th test. He's going to become the oldest seamer to ever bowl a delivery in a test match in India but you've picked up on it as well I think we were all pretty stunned when England rocked up in Hyderabad and there was Jimmy Anderson looking limber lithe not a bit of his 41 years he's got the blonde highlights in his hair I said at the time he looked like Brad Pitt in Fight Club I mean he looks like he's really really there's no no question about his condition no one will be asking anything about whether James Anderson can pre- perform the role that England are asking him to do over the next well however many days it might be indeed I mean it will be I mean it is a, what, a seven, seven month gap now since that last Ashes test which <laughs> on a personal level feels about five minutes ago um, and yeah it'd be interesting to see I mean to be fair I mean I, you know you, you don't want to sort of uh, sparked too many fears about Jimmy but going back to that last day at the Oval um, they had that replacement ball Chris Wokes had it zipping around and Jimmy you know was he, he didn't and it, and, that, and he was looking pretty bereft at the end of what was a pretty tough series um, so maybe the break will be a good thing for him um, certainly the hunger is, is not diminished um, and it's going to be fascinating to see how he goes because he's going to have to perform a few different roles here um, obviously I'm sure he'll start off with the new ball but primarily it's going to be his old ball skills which are going to be tested here in India where his record to be fair 34 wickets at 29 apiece and his economy goes at 2.6 Stokes doesn't care about the economy of course so I don't even know why I'm mentioning that but um, but yeah he's going to have to perform a job here and obviously we can't forget Joe Root as the uh, the support bowler as well and now one place above Stokes in the ICC test all rounder rankings It was a great win for England in Hyderabad for all sorts of reasons and, and the, the records have been listed frequently over the past few days I still thought there was a few places where they could improve. On another day, the three half chances that I counted, I, I thought could cost them, particularly against such a powerful Indian batting lineup. Only two batters passed 50, and, and in India you really do need to make um, make those starts count. But the big one for me was the five out of five DRS decisions <laughs> that Stokes went for. That none of them were correct, not even close enough to get an umpire's call and to keep your review. And we spoke to Ben Folks earlier on in the week, and I was so surprised to hear Folks say, well, we haven't actually got a process. Teams normally say, right, well, captain, keeper and bowler have to agree before they go for a review, or, or whatever it is. Mm. England have got none of that. And Folks were saying how difficult it is, you know, it's so noisy, you never know who's best placed to make the decision. But to me, in these conditions, when the spinners are on, the keeper's up, there's fielders around the bat, DRS dis- D- or, or reviews are like gold dust. Mm. And I'm going to be really interested to see if England have come up with something in this test match. Yeah, it will be interesting if they come up with a system. I guess part of the... I mean, they, I think I compared them to Hungry Hippos in my uh, match report that day. But yeah, Stokes did burn through them in, in under 15 overs. Uh, I think that was partly to get Hartley into the game. I think that showed, you know, he had... Probably one of the one percenters that helped imbue Hartley with that confidence and got him through that initial tough spell that he had. Um, it was also interesting chatting to um, Maria Erasmus over breakfast this morning, who is uh, he was third umpire for that one. He's going to be out in the middle for this one, um, and he was saying that I kind of said, you know, you can sort of put your feet up when one of the captains has burned through the first three and fifteen overs. He said, no, we actually, you know, we really prefer them not to because it it acts as that safety net for the for the officials as well. Um, so yeah, it'd be interesting to see how they go on that front. Um, I'm also, I mean, I'm fascinated to see how, how India go with this pitch. A lot of people have been asking the question as to whether, you know, should they rev it up and, and, and get some more extreme spin in there? Should they flatten it out? Either which way they go could play into England's hands. Obviously, a flat pitch suits their batters, and uh, a heavily spinning pitch will, will, will bring a very inexperienced spin attack into the game. I just wonder why they would want to go away from Hyderabad because, in the cold light of day, if they were to just take a step back from the whole thing, they can remind themselves that, well, for a start, they weren't ruthless enough with the bat on the third morning, so they, they kind of missed a chance there. And the other one was that drop off Holly Pope on 110, you know, 86 runs uh, following up thereafter from his bat. Uh, it was an absolute goober as well. Alex Axel Patel really should have held that. So if I were them, I would be looking at, you know, thinking, you know, that's a match we should have won. As much as, as historic and as brilliant as England were to get that result, India did kind of give it away a bit there. So let's focus on India and earlier on I spoke to their former wicketkeeper Dinesh Kartik. 
Pep Guardiola. A perfectionist. A tactical genius. The best manager of his generation. The best manager in history. Reserve team coach Pep Guardiola, a popular former player at the new camp, will take over from Rijkaard. This is a podcast all about the man who has shaped the modern game. It feels almost as if he solved the riddle, if he's cracked the code for football. From his history in La Masia to dominating football across Europe. He's brought a brand of football to the Premier League that we've never seen before. Everybody plays like Pep's teams now. On football, he takes you to, to heaven. From BBC Five Life. Sporting giant Pep Guardiola. Listen on BBC Sounds. You're listening to the TMS Podcast from BBC Radio Five Live. Dinesh, let's start with the big question. Um, The last time we spoke, you were wearing your England shirt. You said it was because you hadn't done your laundry. I thought it was because England had just won the first test. Let's confirm, have you managed to get your clothes washed? Who are you supporting in the second test? <laughs> there are different shades of blue. In this one, I'm trying to go for the Indian blue. I'm hoping they'll uh, definitely give a good comeback. And knowing how India as a cricket team have done over a period of time, they've always come back well from defeats and uh, from pressure situations. So uh, I'm pretty keen to see how they bounce back on this one. Big news since, um, since the end of the first test. India lost both Ravrindra and Jadeja, and we expected Jadeja actually because we saw that he had that hamstring problem in the first test. But also yeah. KL Rahul to injury. I was surprised at that. I didn't notice any problem with Rahul during the first test, but he's got a little bit of a problem with his quad. When you consider that India are already without Virat Kohli, Rishabh Pant, Mohamed Shami, there's a huge, huge blow. It definitely is. No doubt about that. I think. For KL Rahul, it's slightly precautionary because he's had this uh, bad quarter of injury that happened and then he lost a few months of cricket. So I don't think he wants it to flare up and make it any worse for him. Considering there's a lot of cricket with the five test match series as well. I'm very, very confident we'll be seeing him uh, very soon in the other test matches. But for the moment, Ravindra Jadija is a, is a little bit of a concern. Again, a hamstring injury. There's someone um, who hasn't had too many injuries, but uh, in the recent past, he has picked up a couple of injuries. Just one of the hammy. But the good thing is after the second test, there's a 10-day break also. So they almost get three weeks to recover from this, or two weeks rather. So um, it's going to be uh, interesting times. But India will have definitely a few new faces in this squad. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we get to see um, Kuldeep will surely get a chance. Uh, Rajat Padidar is another one who will get a look in. The big question is whether they go with Siraj or they go with the extra batter. That's going to be the big question. But let's go back just to, to Jadeja and Rahul. Because in the first test, over the two innings, they probably looked like India's most comfortable batters. I know that Jaisval attacked England spinners on the first evening, but Rahul also made runs in the first innings. He was looking settled in the second innings. The Judeja made runs in the first innings. It needed that little bit of brilliance from Ben Stokes to run him out in the second innings. All of a sudden, that India batting lineup's looking very different without Kohli, Rahul, Jadeja. It's always the case, isn't it, in, in sport, when you lose a couple of games, you never look the team or the individual that you are. And that always tends to happen. Yes, you can see there's a little bit of pressure on the batting unit, but in international cricket, the one thing that you deal with quite consistently is uh, dealing with pressure. It's always going to be there. You lose a test, it's uh, you know it's going to be staring back at you or other... You know, strongly at your face, so you've got to find the ways to dig deep and uh, come back stronger. The names that you've just said, the likes of Virat Kohli, Rishabh Pan, Momo Chami, these are big names and they'll be big misses, including Jadeja and KL Rahul, there's no doubt about it. But I must say that the young lot will come in, have come in at the back of some very good domestic performances. They know how to play spin. That's going to be the massive challenge in these kind of conditions and I'm really looking forward to seeing how they uh, go in international cricket and they deserve this opportunity. Rajat, Sarpras, Khan, Sort of Sumar and uh, Puldi Kadav, they've been toiling hard uh, for many years now and they deserve this opportunity. And I'm very confident about their skill sets, especially in playing spells. Let's talk about some of these players then. We'll, we'll take Kuldeep first, actually, because he'll be most known to the fans in the UK. Often as a white ball spinner, that's how we know him best. But he's a bowler that's matured greatly over the past few years, isn't he? Absolutely. There is no doubt. He is the bowler who's grown in its stature in the white ball format. And he was a standout even in the recently concluded 50 World Cup um, 
arguably one of the best uh, wrist spinners uh, in the world right now. Uh, Zamsa had a really good World Cup. Kuldeep Singh, uh, Kuldeep Yadav again had a very, very good World Cup. One of the better spinners going around amongst wrist spinners. Uh, but what's interesting is Rehan Ahmed, obviously the only wrist spinner who played the last game, didn't have the best of games. So with wrist spin comes uh, the uncertainty in length. And uh, that is something that uh, Kuldeep has worked on. The two things that he's worked on is the consistency in length and the speeds that he bowls at. Uh, the quicker he bowls, uh, a lot of the times it's helped him in wild ball cricket. It'll be interesting to see how he adapts to the rigors of test cricket and playing on these kind of pitches which aid spin. So that's going to be the challenge for him. It's been a while since Puldi Jadav played a test, so he's going to start a bit nervous as well. And as for the replacement to KL Rahul, Rajat Patidar was the next batter in the squad. He's made a lot of runs against the England Lions recently, and you know the Lions well because you've been doing some work with them. What can we expect from from Patidar, a man who's not played a test match? He's a high quality batter. Uh, I'm a bit biased about him because uh, I've been watching him very closely in the last eighteen months, and I really feel he's a special talent. Very good looking right hander. He's cut from the same cloth as the Rohit Sharma's. Very good looking, easy on the eye. Plays beautifully in terms of how he handles spin. Really good defence. I'm really confident that he'll do well in international cricket. He's got all the tools uh, to succeed in international cricket. India brought three players into their squad after those injuries. Um, Washington Sundar will be known to a lot of people, an off-spin bowling all-rounder. But there's two other names. One, Surab Kumar, who's a left-arm spinner. He's got nearly 300 wickets in first-class cricket. But the one I'm most interested in is Safaraz Khan, who could get a go in the middle order if India changed the balance of their side. Got a first-class batting average of almost 70. Fourth highest of all time. Those are stunning numbers. Uh, it's brilliant that you bring up Sarfraz Khan in this conversation because he is a batter who needs to be spoken about. A lot many in the current era averages 70. He was actually averaging 82 at a point after about 20, 22 games. He's dropped a bit because I think he just failed in a couple and the average dropped a bit. Extraordinary first class record in the limited time that he's played. He's played close to 35 games and got plenty of runs. Really good player of spin again. And uh, he's handled fast bowling really well as well. Got runs against, uh, got runs in South Africa. Got runs against the England Lions. He's been a consistent performer in the India A setup. Uh, it's, it's very interesting to see how India and England have gone about selections. England have picked a lot of the spinners based on uh, the skills they possess. Whereas uh, India has gone, uh, you know, obviously in terms of how well uh, they have uh, scored in domestic cricket. So it's it's a very interesting uh, way. But Sarfraz Khan is another one who will. Uh, do very well, I'm sure, because he's got all the tools. He, he's someone who bats spin beautifully. And I think in these conditions, he will revel, likes to play shots, especially the sweep, the one thing that we haven't seen the Indians use too much. So it's going to be interesting to see him play if he does. Is the decision for India, Dinesh, the balance of the team, whether or not they persist with Mohamed Siraj as that second seamer? He didn't bowl a great deal in Hyderabad. I think that's the big question. Uh, you can be very sure that Kuldeep will play. And I'm very sure Rajat Patidar is going to play him. Are they going to go in with Safraz or are they going to go in with uh, Saurabh or Washington for uh, Siraj? That's the big question. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they look to get another batter in because it makes sense if you're not going to bowl pass bowling so much. It just makes sense to have the extra batter in. It gives you the opportunity to score a wealthy of runs. Feels, Dinesh, like all of a sudden, India are the team with all the problems. <laughs> it always feels that way, Stefan. If you lose the test match, it's... Uh, it's going to feel like there are things that's not going right. But you win a test match and let things start looking uh, very good. So, um, you know, as an Indian team, I don't think they should be too flustered or frazzled by it. And they have been through such situations quite often. In South Africa recently, when they lost the first test and they got um, pretty much annihilated in the first test, they came back to win the second one. So, they have it in them. When pushed to a corner, they have a way to pounce back and rather strong at it as well. So I'm looking forward to this Indian team doing something very similar. One thing that interested me as well was that Raul Dravid, the coach, he travelled before the rest of the squad to to Vizag from Hyderabad to come and assess the conditions, to assess the pitch. What do you make of that? What would have been the thinking around that? Well, sure, it'll be to understand what the pitch is. Uh, uh, had a word with the curator and figured out what they what was required for this game, whether they are looking to change certain things about it. So it would be along those lines. I really don't know what the conversation would have been, but I can understand that 
you know, been uh, very um, sure about what he wants the pitch to be. So, I had a word with the curator. And what do India want the pitch to be? Do they want it to turn? Or is it better for India to play on a, a flatter pitch, knowing that they realistically have got more skillful bowlers than England and would be in a better position to take 20 wickets? Oh, I think they'll go for a pitch that definitely aids spin. The thing in Hyderabad, the one thing that was very evident was how slow the pitch was. Even after the ball pitched, it literally had so much time before it got to the batter, which could be a problem. And uh, looking at how they reverse swept and swept, uh, it felt like those shots were very useful on those kind of pitches. So they'd probably look for one with slightly more pace off the pitch, even with a little bit of turn. So that way they can probably induce a few top edges or the one that hits through can go on to hit the pad. Uh, that's something that they will be looking at. I'm glad you mentioned sweeps and reverse sweeps, uh, Dinesh. Yesterday, in, in practice in Vizag, Shreyas Iyer was out in the middle. He was practicing his sweeps and his reverses. In the second innings in Hyderabad, we saw Rohit Sharma go to the reverse a couple of times. Not something we see from India batters very often. Are they looking to, to imitate England? Is imitation the most sincere form of flattery? Shreyas Iyer uh, is not someone who sweeps a lot, but he realizes that on turning pitches like these, it, it, it is an option that he needs to explore. Whereas the Rohit Sharma is someone who plays the sweep a lot more. Sarpraz will play the sweep. Rajat Patikar has a very decent sweep. So, these, pe- these players do have the sweep. Among the ones who are playing right now, Vyashashvi sweeps beautifully. I think he's the best sweeper right now in the Indian team. So, there are players. But yeah, I mean, in a way, they understand how well England have played it and what works for them. And looks like sweep and reverse sweep. More so, the reverse sweep is a shot that really works. It's not a shot that you can develop uh, in between test matches. But it is an option that you need to explore and have as part of your arsenal. In, uh, in turning pitches. Last one, Dinesh. What's going to happen? Come on. At the end of this match, is it going to be one all or 2 0 to England? One all, Stefan. One all. And and then we'll see what shirt you're wearing at the end of yes. this match, won't we? Right from the start, Stefan. It's going to be the tri colour, not the three lions. This is the TMS podcast from BBC Radio 5 Live. That was former. India wicketkeeper batter Dinesh Kartik. Ali, to me, the most fascinating aspect of this game now, or this second test match, is is how India are going to respond. They haven't lost the first two tests of a home series since the year 2000. No, and uh, and obviously I mentioned at the top of the show there about the the absence of Virat Kohli, where you you get that real reminder here, given how much he bent that game to his will here uh, back in 2016. That final day run out of Ravindra Jadeja by Ben Stokes. I mean, a massive plus for Stokes because it kind of proved his own fitness after that knee operation. He's moving brilliantly. And as he put it to us last night, he probably doesn't pull that off last summer. He'd probably be thinking about his movements and not thinking about the play itself. But in doing so uh, and getting Jadeja to strain to make his ground and ultimately not make it, he twanged that ham- hamstring. And when you take a player of Ravindra Jadeja's quality out of this India to side, um, you know, it, it's going to be a big ask for whoever does step up for them. Yeah, how India respond, I guess, is forming the, the subplot to this second test with England 1-0 up. 